I love the Psalms. I call the book of Psalms God's medicine cabinet. And if I'm hungry, I read the Word of God. If I am depressed, I take some medicine. If I uh, am in sorrow and pain, I take pain relief out of this book. And I often turn to the Psalms a lot to just, in my daily reading, if I'm just need something to read from the Bible. It'll usually be out of the book of Psalms. Uh, David wrote this some 3,000 years ago. Solomon was 1,000 years before Christ. Christ was about 2,000 years ago. So that puts David somewhere around 3,000 years ago. And I mentioned this last night. God showed David something that uh, I actually had a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Chuck Thurston, who is a medical doctor, He's a, he was a uh, ER doctor, and those guys have to be sharp, they have to think very quickly. And we're talking about a, a big city ER, not Delphi ER, okay? And um, you, gotta, you gotta be really quick and really sharp. And he's the first one that introduced to me the idea. This was, I'm gonna say, probably about 16 years ago, that Every cell in your body was a living stone. Just like 1 Peter says, we as living, as lively stones. So every cell in your body, it's the stones that build this temple. And every cell is a picture of the tabernacle that was in the wilderness. The cell membrane is the curtain around the tabernacle area. The altar is where they burnt the sacrifices. Sacrifices were always animal, or they were always like flour, fine flour mixed, mingled with oil and certain things. But it was always something to eat, okay? Everything that was burnt on the altar was something to eat, because the, the Levites got a portion of that uh, for, their, for their salary, for their pay, okay? So the altar is the mitochondria. The mitochondria in your cell does this one thing. It takes the sugar that your liver has converted the food that that you're eating right now, it's being converted into sugars, and those sugars are looking for an entryway into the cell. And there is what's called an insulin receptor in in your cell. Insulin, I learned this because I have type 2 diabetes, and I controlled it by losing 80 pounds, okay? But with my diabetes, I found out what my insulin was doing. The insulin is uh, this little hormone chemical that the cell wall has an insulin receptor. Insulin literally opens a door to the sanctuary, to the cell, so that sugars can go in. Nothing else can go in, only sugar which is interesting because there was always a priest standing at the doorway of the tabernacle and he always examined what came in that tabernacle. And if you were not a Levite priest or it was not your time to go in and if you were not an animal sacrifice or wheat or something like that, you didn't go in. And so I learned that the insulin in my body were the priest, the Levite priest, who brought the sacrifices, the sugar, into the cell, into the tabernacle. And when you have type 2 diabetes, you either, your Levite priests are too lazy to do anything, or there's not enough of them, okay? And that was the deal with me. I had insulin, but it wasn't enough insulin, and the insulin I had wasn't able to do what it, so sugar was building up in my bloodstream, okay? So once the insulin is, or once the sugar gets in, the The priest will take the sacrifice, the lamb or the goat or the the fine flour, the bread, and take it and put it on the altar, and it's burnt. The mitochondria takes the sugar, and it literally burns the sugar in this little factory that it has, the mitochondria, and it burns it, and when it burns it, it releases a form of energy called ATP. And I don't know what, adenine triphosphate or something like that, But anyway, it's exactly what happens on the altar. It 
it's burnt. The reason why your body temperature is 98.6 right now is because your cells are literally burning sugar and that's what's giving you the heat in your body. It's just like the altar. And then the nucleus was the, the sanctuary or the most holy place. And in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was a copy of the law that Moses had written. It was a rolled up scroll. Well, you know what DNA looks like, don't you? It's a, it looks like a rolled up scroll is what it looks like. And in that DNA are letters and words called genes and paragraphs and verses and everything that you are is written into your DNA. And that's stored in the nucleus, which is the most holy place where the book of the law was stored. And this doctor's telling me this and I'm just going, you mean the Bible's right? We are the tabernacle of God which means that we didn't come from monkeys. We didn't come from some gooey gel 14 million years ago that lightning struck and everything like that. We were created by God in His image, spoken by God. God said, let us make, why did He say let us make man in our image after our likeness? Why did He say it that way? There are three that bear record. The Father, Lord, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So we're made in the image of God. Uh, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. We are spirit, soul, and body. Okay? So anyway, Psalm 139, David wrote this down by inspiration of the Holy Ghost 3,000 years before Watson and Crick, who got a Nobel Prize for this thing, they discovered what DNA was like and how it's rolled up and you know, how it joins together, this and that and the other. But David knew it by way of the Holy Ghost 3,000 years ago. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written. Every member of your body. By the way, this works double. If you belong to the church of the living God, raise your hand, you are a member of the body of Jesus Christ. And in his book, your name is written. Isn't that beautiful? You are in thy book. All my members were written. And I hope that every one of us has our name written in the book of life of the Lamb of Almighty God. Amen? Which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. So here's one way of looking at this. In thy book, all my members were written. Because... Coded into your DNA is the shape of your hand, the number of bones in your hand, the veins that run through your hand, the skin, the color of your skin. Are you going to have a lot of hair coming out of your skin? You're going to have very little hair coming out of your skin. All that's written in the DNA. Uh, your, even your ugly parts. Hey, didn't Paul say that the ugly parts have more use than the pretty parts? I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of what he was saying. Our more comely parts are not as useful as the parts that are uncomely. Nobody goes around saying, look at that gal's armpits. Look at her. We don't say that. But they, ser <laughs> they serve a purpose. You, you'll see people, you'll see people in summertime outside walking around like this. Why? They're cooling off. This holds in heat. You see them in the wintertime like this. It's, we do it without even thinking we're doing it. We get cold and we do this. Why? These are the heat doors. They're either holding in the heat because this is the vital organ area of your body or in the summertime we walk around like this with our arms out and we, don't, we do it instinctively. We don't even think about it because God put it in our book that when we get hot, we throw our arms out like this and we let that heat out. And this ugly part of our body serves that wonderful, wonderful function, a wonderful purpose. Your lips are written in God's book. Your toes, your eyes, every part of your body is written. If you have it as part of your body, then it's written in your DNA book. Here's another way of looking at it. In thy book, which is DNA, all my members were written. Every member of our family. Open your Bible to Genesis chapter 2. 
I, I'm getting ahead of myself. This, I'm going to show this on the screen, but I'm going to show it now. Remember that number 46? Remember that number? That's, that's how many chromosomes, where you're, that's like packages where all your DNA is. It's like you had 46 barns, and you're putting all the seed into 46 barns. You have 46 chromosomes that are bundled up, and that's where all your DNA books are, okay? So in Genesis chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 21. And the Lord, caused, uh, Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, now guess what I did? I counted the words that Adam said. If you want to do this, you can. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. 46 words here exactly. And when you think about it, he's talking about DNA. The man contributes 23 chromosomes, the woman contributes 23 chromosomes, and when those come together, they form a one-celled organism called an embryo. And that embryo is a human being, which means if you take it out of the uterus and kill it, you've just committed murder in God's eyes. Can I hear God's people say amen? amen. It is absolute slaughter of human beings in this country, and I hate it. I absolutely hate it. it makes me angry. Urgh. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. But they have 46 words that he said here. And then look at what he said. Shall, shall cleave his wife and they shall be one flesh. It means exactly what it says. Because the man and the woman cleave together. And a little baby is the one flesh of those two people. Isn't it beautiful how this Bible's written? Amen. You count the words yourself. There's going to be 46 words in there. Now, let me tell you what's happening in the world. Scientists, what's the difference between scientists and God? God never pretends he's a scientist. <laughs> scientists right now are playing God. Because scientists have figured out how to take, this clearly tells you, that a human child comes as a product of a man and a woman cleaving together. Says it clearly. Science now can make a baby from three parents, or four parents, or five, or six, or however many they want. If you don't believe me, Great Britain in the last, since I started doing the Watchmen video broadcast in 2009, Great Britain, in that time span of what's been set eight, eight years, Great Britain has already put laws in place that allow three parent babies to exist in Great Britain. Three parent babies. That's an abomination, if you ask me. That is a that is a destruction of God's way, and it is utter confusion. How can you even fathom that? Because there are laws in practically every country that deal with inheritance, right? So a child with multiple parents, whose kid is that? Well, it's Dave's and Bob's and Bill's and Sally's and Susie's and these three gay guys over here and these two women over here, we have no idea how many different parents this child is. It is absolute confusion. And God's going to get it one of these days. Amen? God's going to take care of it. Anyway, watch this. In that, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned because here the embryo doesn't have hands or feet or eyes or anything like that, but they're written in the genetic code. And as that child grows, those body parts begin to form out when as yet there was none of them. Day one, you're a cell. Day two, you're two cells. 
Now you're four cells. Now you're eight. Now you're 16. Now you're 32. Now you're 64 and so on. And you just keep growing and growing and adding members. What happened on the day of Pentecost? There was just 12 men there. 120 gathered in the upper room. And by the end of the day, 3,000 people had been brought in as members of the body. And the body has been growing every day since then. Amen? Because God is still adding new members to the body. But one of these days, one of these days, the child is going to be ready. And that's going to be the end of bringing in Gentiles into the kingdom. And we're going to be taken into heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. Deoxyribonucleic acid is what DNA stands for. Packaged in 46 chromosomes, placed inside the cell nucleus. Here's your chromosome here. What does that look like? Like a letter X? That's, and they call it an X chromosome. Uh, here's, here's one here and so on. So the DNA is rolled up like a scroll and bundled, and there's like 46 of these that go inside the nucleus of the cell. So here is the cell wall. Here is the tabernacle curtain. Here is the most holy place. And Moses wrote the book of the law, and he rolled it up, and he put it right in the most holy place. And that's exactly where the DNA is stored. Here's what we know about DNA. Rolled up in a helix form, which means twisted or crooked. Can you think of anything in the Bible, a Bible verse, where it uses the word crooked? Give me one. Don't just nod your head and act like you're smart. Give me a verse in the Bible that uses the word crooked. A crooked and perverse what? The word gene is in the word generation. Say wow backwards. Wow. Same thing. Um... John the Baptist, Elijah, it was prophesied that he was going to make the crooked things straight. I'll show you what that means in a little bit, okay? Um, anyway, it's rolled together in a, in a crooked form. It has two spines like the legs of a ladder. Can you think of a story in the Bible that has a ladder in it? That was easy, wasn't it? You know who, you know who that ladder was? It's Christ. Because he saw the angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder, and Jesus said that you shall hereafter you shall see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is that ladder. And by the way, Jesus is also the book, the Word of God. Amen? Okay? So there's your ladder, and linked together by four compounds. So watch this. You have two rungs. These are made of sugar and phosphorus. What is phosphorus? What does it, what does it do? How does it... Um, bullets that are dipped in phosphorus, phosphorus what, are they, what are they for? They're tracer bullets. They light up when you shoot them, so you know in the dark what you're shooting at. Phosphorus means light bearer, and phosphorus basically is light. Sugar. Can you think of anything in the Bible that tastes sweet? Honey and the manna. They were eating the manna, and it tasted like honey. It was sweet as honey, and the manna was the Word of God. Jesus Christ. So your DNA is a book that's made out of sugar because it tastes sweet and it's a book made out of light. The entrance of thy words giveth what? Light, the Bible says. Isn't that cool? Okay? So now watch this. What joins this part of the ladder with this part of the ladder is four compounds. A is for adenine, T is for thymine, C is for cytosine, G for guanine. Now everybody take out a piece of paper, close your books, and tell me what four compounds... I'm just giving you a pop quiz. <laughs> See if you're listening. Adenine, just say A, C, G, and T. A, C, G, T. 
Everybody say A C G T. How many of them are there? It's all you need to know. Now here's here's the interesting part. You see here on this on this DNA that adenine A always connects with thymine. Adenine never connects with cytosine or guanine. It's like putting a square peg in a round hole. They don't go together. Cytosine then only connects with guanine. So the rules are if you have this half of the ladder and you had guanine here, you know that it has to be cytosine over here. It has to be. Can't be anything else. That's very important because Isaiah said, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. Every time a cell divides and makes a new cell in your body, what it does is it takes that DNA strand, cuts it in half. It sends one half of the copy into the new cell. The new cell needs to... Um, reform that whole book again and it knows how to do it automatically because if it sees guanine on this side it has to be cytosine on this side and if it sees adenine on here it must be thymine over here is that simple enough for everybody to understand so it's just like the bible watch this okay if i were to say um if i were to say in exodus there was a passover lamb does it connect to something here in the New Testament? Like John the Baptist saying what? Behold, the Lamb of God. See how the Old Testament is mated together with the New Testament. Okay? So if there is a stone here that the Israelites drank water from in the Old Testament, the New Testament tells us what about that stone? In 1 Corinthians 10, that rock that followed them was Christ. It's mated to the New Testament. Okay, Is that, does that make sense, everybody? Because this is the Old Testament, and this is the New Testament. And what joins them both together, open your Bibles up, open your Bibles up, and look at your Bible. Turn to, just turn to the beginning of the New Testament. Turn to the very beginning, the very first page of the New Testament. So your Bible should look like this, okay? Now, hold your place here and turn to the very first page of the book of Acts. See what I'm doing here? This is the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. And what is it that joins the Old Testament types and shadows with New Testament doctrine? Four books called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. Because everything in the Old Testament was about the law and here the doctrine talks about the fulfillment of the law and the fulfillment of the law was right here in these four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus came, made under the law, amen, and he fulfilled everything here and what joins these two together. Think of the New, New Testament as heaven and think of the Old Testament as us here on this earth and what makes it possible for us to be connected to heaven. Who's the mediator between us and God? And it's these four, these four chemicals that when they come together in a certain sequence, that's what makes the letters of the genes of your DNA. Literally, the Word of God is right here in these four books called Adenine, Guanine, Cytosine, and Thymine. Now, if y'all was Pentecostal, you'd be shouting and throwing your Bibles up in the air and dancing and... Hey, listen, they shout it. I preached this in Kenya. I preached this in Samburu, Kenya, where we have a, a FM radio station. And those people, the, the guy that was translating for me was the pastor of this church, and he was translating into Samburu language. And I said, like, I, I gave like 
three words in a sentence, and it took him like three minutes to translate it. And I said, did it really take that long? He said, they don't have a word. What was it they didn't have a word for in their language? So he had to explain to them in their language what it was I was talking about. But when they got it, they danced. They smiled, they shouted. And I said, God sent this Mzungu, which means white guy, all the way over here to tell you that you people in Kenya, where everybody in the world doesn't think anything about the black man at all, but God made you to be the temple of Almighty God. And they got happy. I loved it. So that's how it's paired. Adenine always goes with thymine, cytosine with guanine. What is that? Okay, so think of the combinations of these four together as like a form of Morse code. For every letter, there's a dot and a dash. In Morse code, there's nothing more than a dot and a dash, correct? Okay, there, so in DNA, there's really nothing more than adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. That's it. But it's the combination, how it says adenine, thymine here, and then it says guanine, cytosine here, then it says guanine, cytosine again here, and those three together would make like one part of a gene. And then you have three more that makes another letter, and then three more that makes another letter, and so on and so on and so on, and that's how DNA is coded. Or it's like binary. It's like the binary language in computer. Every computer in the world speaks a language of zeros and ones. And it goes all the way back to the old days where the IBM computer took up half of this county and you had guys in lab coats literally programming the computer by flipping switches on and off. And so now with the days of the transistor, those switches became electronic and now the current either goes through or it doesn't go through. And so it's either a zero or a one. And the pairing of zeros and ones together in a certain sequence makes your computer, your phone, your, if you, these new hearing devices now, there are many computers, the car, literally everything that has a processor in it speaks the same simple language that DNA speaks. So let me give you something else scary. The scientists found out because computers read binary, zeros and one, on and off, because they, computers read that language, some genius decided that since DNA is coded the exact same way, I wonder if I can program a strand of DNA like I would a computer. And they did. And they now had the ability, like my phone there, I think it's like, a, I think that phone is 128 gig, which means a hold 128 gigabytes of memory, okay? And it's that big. DNA is so small that we can't see it even with a microscope, and yet they can take a little piece of DNA and put the entire volume of every book on this planet and store it on this little DNA strand. So they now know how to program, or let's say it like this, they now know how to reprogram DNA. And DNA is not their book to reprogram. Kevin, what would happen if where you work, you got caught with pirated software on your computer? Fired! Why? It's not your software. Or if you hacked into Microsoft Windows 10 because you didn't like it, and who does, you decided you rewrite it. Bill Gates himself would come down and throw you out of the building because it's not your software, right? DNA is not their book. It's God's book. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Amen. amen. So now watch this. So we have... A codon, the word codon means like a letter. So if I say a codon, you know what that means, right? A codon is a letter. Okay. The way these are arranged, there can be 64 possible combinations of three bases. 
Notice in John 7, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Okay? DNA makes letters. So let's say that this combination of adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine made this amino acid here. An amino acid is like the letter R, or an amino acid is like the letter A. If you have this type of amino acid, then it's the letter R. If you have another type, it's, a, it's another letter. Does that make sense? Because all the letters look different. Or we can say these three things together make the letter B in your DNA. And here's what's interesting. There are 22 amino acids that make up the genetic code of DNA, and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew. Turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. What you see in Psalm 119 are words like Aleph, Beth, Daleth, He, Val, Zane, Cheth, Teth, Yod. What are those? Hebrew letters. Because every eight verses in your Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, Verse 1, the first word of verse 1 started with the letter A, Aleph. In verse 9, the first word of verse 9 started with the letter Beth, and so on and so on. That's why Psalm 19 has those letters there, is that when it was written out, when God gave it to David, he gave it to him in that exact order. The book of Lamentations is, turn to Lamentations. The book of Lamentations is done in a very similar fashion. If you notice in Lamentations 1, how many verses do you have? How many? 22. That's because every first word of every verse of Lamentations 1 starts with that Hebrew letter of the alphabet. It's in, the verses go in alphabetical order. Now notice verse 3, or chapter 3. How many letters, how many verses does it have? 66. How many books are in the Bible? That's because every third verse of Lamentations 3 starts with the Hebrew alphabet. Verse 1 starts with Aleph. Verse 4 starts with Beth. And I'm talking about in Hebrew. Verse, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Verse 7 starts with Aleph, Beth, Gimel, whatever. I didn't memorize Hebrew. But it, what's interesting to me is the book of DNA is written with the exact same number of letters as the Old Testament was written in. So it not only is a book written by God, it was written in Hebrew. Amen. <laughs> oh my. So, DNA equals the Bible. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. This is Psalm 119, 156. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgments. What does the word quicken mean? Make me alive according to thy judgments. We're dead without the letters of the book. Amen? How many churches now are not using the book any longer? They're dead, aren't they? They're dead. And they can dance and shout and hoot and holler and have loud music, but be dead spiritually because they're not using the word, the incorruptible word of God anymore. So here's how your DNA is built. It's like a rolled up scroll, okay? Notice this, it's made out of sugar. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Uh, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Uh, Ezekiel 2 9 and when I was looked behold in hands that was sent unto me and lo a roll of a book was therein and when he ate it it was as honey for sweetness it was like God was handing him a DNA scroll and said here eat this when he ate it it, it, it tasted sweet just like DNA does so I'm going to give you a word the word is book or books and as you read your Bible when you see the word book or books in your Bible, pay attention to what's there. 
Pay attention to what's there. Revelation 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's because it's made of phosphorus. Now watch this. Boy, I'm, I'm getting ahead of him. Oh, turn to Genesis, turn to Genesis 5. I told you to look for the word book, right? The very first occurrence of the word book is in Genesis 5. Take a look at it, verse 1. Genesis 5, verse 1. What does it say? This is the book of the what? The word gene is in the word generations. Why? The word gene is in the word genealogy. And what is genealogy? It is the list of where I came from. And my genes came from my genealogy. I am the product of my mom and my dad. And my wife reminds me of that all the time. You are just like your dad. You are just like your mom. Really? I'm turning into them? I'm just like my grandma and grandpa and their grandma and grandpa. In fact, I'm Adam. Adam was carrying Mike Hoggard in his loins. That's how I got here, was from Adam, and so did you. What kind of nationalities are in this room? I, my, Hoggard is a British name, it's, but in England it's Hogard. Sounds a whole lot more sophisticated. <laughs> Hogard. It's Hoggard. We were guards of hogs, okay? Uh, what else do we have here? German? What else? Filipino. Filipino. What else? We got any, got any Spanish, got any Cherokee, sweetie pie, she's got Cherokee in her. Czechoslovakia. Czechos I wouldn't admit that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> when, when in Slovakia, do as the other Slavs do, I guess. Okay. But we're all from Adam. In fact, we're all from Noah. You know how many races of men, primary races there are on the earth? Primary races. Mongoloid, Caucasoid, Negroid. How many sons did Noah have? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And that's where we all came from. And all over the world, there's variations of that, but all of us were from Adam. He was carrying all of us in him when he sinned. That's why we are born sinners. Amen? And we need a Savior. But Jesus wasn't. He was half man, or fully man, and fully God at the same time. He was the only one qualified to hang on that cross. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. So the very first occurrence of the word book is in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, does anybody know... And you can find out there in the first five verses of Genesis chapter 5. Can somebody tell me how old Adam was when he died? Adam lived 930 years, right? Starting at Genesis 1, go to the 930th chapter of the Bible. It's Matthew 1. And it says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Isn't that neat? That is awesome. That's wow. Frontwards, backwards, upside down. It's everything. God is the one who put all these chapters in here. God is the one who put all these words in here. It, it had to be the hand of the Almighty God who takes us from the generation of Adam because as an Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We have passed from death unto life, the Bible says. Woo! Here's the last occurrence of the word book. Revelation 22, 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this. 
And we mentioned this last night. DNA is not only a book that God wrote, it is a book of prophecy. Because when you were conceived, none of the members of your body were present. They weren't showing up. But it was written in the DNA code that they would show up. So, it begs the question, when did you get saved? Because according to God, he wrote you in the book from the foundation of the world. God always knew who was going to be saved and who wasn't. And ahead of everything, he writes their name in the book. All my members are written in the book, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Doesn't that just... And you, you ask the question, how did God know? Well, what if I would have? God would have known it. Well, what if I would have said? God knew that too. You can't beat God at chess. Amen? He's like, he controls all the pieces. Oh, listen. I, you know, I didn't really know that was occurring, but let me tell you what I think. God knew it. God knew it. That's, thank you. Here's what I think. Watch this. When we are saved, Jesus said in Revelation, um, if you continue, then I will give you a white stone with a new name. In Genesis 7, 17 is a number for transformation. In Genesis 17, Abram is no longer Abram. He's Abraham. Sarai is Sarah. It's got breath in it now, okay? They both were transformed and they both had a name change, Genesis 17, okay? When we're saved, we are a new creature. Old things are passed away. When we're in heaven, I don't think I'll be known as Michael Hoggard. I'll have a new name. Flip that upside down. Turn it over 180 degrees. Because everything God does, the devil does the opposite of it. To me, a name change is all about transformation. And normally, I would say that people who are changing their name are not people who are 60, 70, 80 years old. These are a newer generation, okay, who does not know God. And I think that there is coming. I mean, I'm, I'm setting you up on this verse right here to show you what science is doing. Because science is going to change everybody except us whose names are written in the book of life. Everybody on this world is going to voluntarily submit to an alteration in their genetics. It's already in place. It's already going to happen. Okay? With a transformation comes a new name, a different name. Does that make sense to you? That's, I think it's a spirit that's driving these people to do that. Okay? Just, huh? Prince. Prince. Yeah, the artist formerly known as Prince. Uh, just recent, how many corporations are changing their identity? Just recently, in St. Louis area, the gas company is called Laclede Gas. It's named after the French explorer Laclede. St. Louis is a very French area. It was Laclede Gas for years. Just this year, they've changed their name to Spire, S P I R E. Okay? Why? Dun, dun, dun. Why change your name? It's a marketing thing. It's a, it's everything is going to be changed. Every creature. They're altering the DNA of mosquitoes so that the mosquitoes don't carry malaria anymore. But what is that going to do to everything else that the mosquitoes do? They're changing bees. They're changing horses. They're changing grain rice grown in Kansas several years ago in a test they had a test plot and I forgot what company it was might have been Monsanto but they had planted this whole field full of rice that had human DNA in it okay changing the genetic makeup of cows so that they produce milk that is different so that people with um, lactose intolerant can drink the milk 
and not worry about getting sick. But what, what else are they doing to the cow? And it's just like people changing the Bible. When you change the Bible, you might think that you're doing yourself or somebody else a big favor. But look at what God said. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's, that's the Bible, number one. So, the new translators, they've taken Greek manuscripts that were rejected by the King James translators. They were rejected. They take these new manuscripts from the Vatican and they say these are the better manuscripts. And in 60, in the, between the NIV and the King James, there are 64,000 less words in it. Every word's important. So what if your doctor said, uh, you're going to have a baby, and there's nothing wrong with your baby, but according to new government specifications, your child has a genetic thing in its DNA that is no longer allowed by the government, and we need to alter your, your baby's DNA, or it cannot be born. You think I make that up? This is coming. This is walking in our direction, and it's getting closer and closer every day. So God said, don't change the words in this book, the Mormon church. What did they do? What did the Mormons do? They didn't take away from the Bible. They called it another testament of Jesus Christ. It's another gospel. It's the, exact, it's the exact thing Paul said. Though we are an angel from heaven, bring you any other gospel, let him be accursed. And where did Joe Smith get his Book of Mormon from? The angel moron, I came down from heaven, bringing him this, showing him this, this tablets, said, translate these. It's another testament. It's another God. An angel from heaven did that. So think about it. What is it coming? What's coming to this world? Bible prophecy tells us that some angels, evil angels, Revelation 12, are going to be cast out of heaven to this earth. And they're going to bring an age of transformation to mankind. Altering man's, altering the book that God wrote. In the last 20 years, God has made me adamant that this book is right in everything that it says. And I don't have a right to change it. And you don't either. And I have found that by not changing the words, God gives me inspiration, revelation, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, because I just believe every word of God is still pure. I believe every word in here. I don't understand every word, but I believe every word. So my DNA. So my grandmother on my mom's side died of Alzheimer's. My aunt on my mom's side died of Alzheimer's. So my mom's nervous that it might be in the genetics. So they're working on, right now, a cure for Alzheimer's. It's not a pill. It's not a shot. It's not radioactive therapy. It's a genetic alteration. A way to change the DNA code, not just in one cell, but in every cell of that person's body. They literally are going to be a child that did not come from their mom and dad because they're going to get a DNA change. And let's say, because they're doing this now, they, they, like I said, they put human DNA in rice. Let's say that they found something in sharks Sharks don't get cancer, right? It's because they don't smoke, right? Because they can't keep them lit underwater, okay? So sharks don't get cancer. So they say, humans get cancer, sharks don't get cancer. Oh, look, we found the, G the DNA code in sharks that keeps them from getting cancer. 
If we put that in human beings, then human beings would no longer get cancer. But at what point does a human being stop being a human being and being something different? Turn to John 1, 1, and I'm going to close with this. I'm going to show you just how important this is. John 1, 1. Has anybody here ever just really got into it? I mean, knock down, drag out with Jehovah's Witness. They come to your porch knocking on your door. Uh-oh. How'd you do, Matt? Mm-hmm. John 1, verse 1. Uh, Charles Taze Russell, uh, who founded Jehovah's Witness cult, uh, was, I can't remember what denomination it was, but he was a church member, and he heard the minister speaking and teaching about hell, and he didn't like it. So he decided that it was wrong. So he started looking at the Bible differently. He started looking at things in the Bible that he didn't think should be there. So he started changing it. But really, the Jehovah's Witness cult, when you ask the Jehovah's Witness, do they believe that Jesus is Almighty God, what will they say? No, they say no. The Jehovah's Witness believe, and they will be honest about it, they do not believe that Jesus is God Almighty. But that's what your Bible says. It's not in their Bible. It's not in their Bible, okay? Because they changed it. Every place where they could find, they, they were very thorough. Because I, I knew a guy who used to be a Jehovah's Witness. And he would call me every now and then, and I would ha I'd be, have a whole list of verses waiting to nail him with. And as I would hit him with those verses, he would read me the New World Translation. And I'm going, oh, man, they got it. They were very thorough. But it really all boils down to John 1.1. Because John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's it. There's no argument. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I know who that is. Jesus is the Word of God. Revelation 19 makes that clear. 1 John 5, 7 makes that clear. The whole Bible makes it clear that Jesus is the Word and Jesus is God. So if you took a letter, letter A, and added it to, and the word was a God. All of Jehovah's Witness doctrine on Jesus and his deity hinges, is altered by adding one letter to John 1.1. 1, 1. He goes from being God to a God. Little G God, one of the angels, right? Okay, see it all hinges. I mean, your whole view, if John 1.1 1, 1 told us, and it was in the Greek and we knew it, that Jesus was a God, if that's what that verse said, then everything else we read in the Bible is now altered by that perception. Does that make sense to you? Okay, without it, to me, everything in the Bible declares that Jesus is God because that's what John 1.1 1, 1 says. So all you got to do is add one letter to one verse. So your doctor, listen people, listen to me. Why are they trying to shove mandatory health care down everybody's throat? Government health care. Why is this, here Donald Trump has been fighting this and he vowed to undo Obamacare, which was going to lead to socialized medicine in this country, and he is trying everything he can to dump that bill, and not even the Republicans are going to work with him. There's something going on. So you think about it. You think about it. You see, in the old days, even if you didn't have health insurance, if you had a critical life emergency and went to the hospital, by law, they had to treat you and stabilize you. They couldn't just let you die. I've been to Kenya. In, in Kenya, if you are dying, if you are bleeding out and show up at a hospital, you have to have the money in your hand, or they won't let you in the door. They'll let you die in the street. This is not Kenya. This is America. And hospitals don't let people die. So that was the old days. The new days, you've got to have health insurance. And it's going to turn into socialized, government-forced medicine. 
even, even if that, even if I'm wrong about that, insurance companies are all about not having to spend money on you. They don't mind taking the money from you for your health insurance. They don't like giving it out very much, do they? And they have a list of all kinds of things that they don't cover anymore in your health care, right? Am I right? I'm speaking your Deutsch, ain't I, okay? Yeah, 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 okay. So anyway, so let's say, let's say five, six, let's say seven years from now. Seven years from now. They have a genetic cure for about 25% of the diseases that right now your insurance company will cover if you get those diseases, like heart disease or anything else. And they have a genetic cure in seven years. And people are getting this genetic cure. And you're not. Because some goofy preacher from Missouri said, don't let them change your DNA, people. And the health insurance company writes you a letter and says, you need to report to your doctor because you have a genetic sequence that tells us that in the next 10 years, you're going to die of heart disease. And we are not going to cover you unless you have this procedure done. And all we need to do is do what we've done with 10,000 people already, and that is alter your genetic code so you don't have heart disease anymore. Well, and as a matter of fact, if you have this done, we will cut your premiums by 50%. Because they're going to save a million dollars on you. Don't do it. Because remember what Revelation 13 said about the mark of the beast? So that no man could buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Buying and selling is what insurance is all about. You buy it, they sell it. And they'll tell you what they'll cover and what they won't cover. And if you won't go get the genetic pill that they have, they'll just cut you off and say, we're not covering you anymore. You cannot buy what we're selling unless you have what we tell you to have. It's coming. Is it not coming? It's coming. And I don't know if it's going to be seven years from now, ten years from now, or next year. I have no idea. But I know that I'm ready to take a stand for the Word of God. And see, I have the testimony of Jesus Christ literally inside of me. Let me show you something. Remember that X chromosome? Let me get to it here. Hang on. Well, wouldn't you like to know what all that is? <laughs> I have a video on it. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Almost there. Every one of those chromosomes is a cross. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth. Christ is the DNA word book. Christ lives in me. Somebody say amen. amen. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord. What a world we live in. Every day, every day, scientists are telling us this and they're telling us that. And some of that stuff they're telling us is just stuff they made up. It's lies. But some of it, Lord, is actually revealing what has been in your word now for thousands of years. Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving us a book, a roadmap, a manual, a medicine cabinet, the healing balm that we need. Thank you, Lord, for giving us Jesus Christ living inside of us, literally, the words of our DNA, the words of our Bible. He is with us all the time. Thank you, Father, for showing me what this book really was. I 
Father, I pray, dear God, that you would allow your Holy Ghost to minister to these people. We've come here, sat here now two hours. Lord, that you would minister to them. Show them the awesome things that you have in your word. Just sitting there waiting for them to discover. I pray, God, that you would open our eyes. That you would open our ears. Open up our hearts, dear God, to the words that are in this book. Show us great and mighty things that we know not. And God, prepare your people, all of your people, to be ready to stand when the evil day comes. And having done all, to stand. Bless us, dismiss us in your care. Give us rest tonight. Bring us back tomorrow night, Lord, and we'll, I promise you, Lord, we'll do everything we can to honor and glorify Jesus Christ and to magnify your word even above your name. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight.